I began thinking about this PowerPoint this summer, how to illustrate all the steps I go through when I'm designing a garden for a client and in what order the steps are implemented. And this is the result. Some houses are more interesting than others. And the difference often is landscaping. Real estate professionals advise that landscaping can add up to 15% more in home valuation. It's also important to remember that not every garden design is perfect at once. The garden evolves, you develop other ideas, and it's all okay. I want to thank all the master gardeners for their photos that I used in this presentation. Also many thanks to the two homeowners who gave me their before and after photos. At the end of the presentation, there are three handouts for you. Color and the color wheel, which delves into color theory. A four page handout called Garden Design 101, which covers everything I talk about in this presentation. And a 10 minute U handout, which covers the main subjects of this presentation. So the ob objectives today are to discover the basic steps of the design process, practical issues and des design elements. Understand what to do first. Become familiar with the process of how to create a garden design. See how pleasing designs are composed and learn the schedule of implementing your garden design. Line, form, texture, and color are the basics in design elements that I'm gonna talk about throughout the presentation. Line in the landscape may be the sharp edge of paving, structure, or rock, the boundary between two different surface materials as grass and soil. In this photo, the line is the difference between the sidewalk and the soil. Form is the shapes of individual plants in a landscape. This may include squares, circles, triangles, or irregular shapes. So here we have a round shape. The conifer is an upward shape. There are soft roundings over here. And this is an upward shape too, even though it's a rogersia, but the flower gives it an upward shape. Texture is the shape and surface of a plant's leaves. It can be coarse, fine, feathery, fuzzy, thorny. So in this photo, look at the grassy leaves. That's the texture. Color is one of the most visible ways of expressing your personality in the garden. Color can come from both leaves and flowers. This is an example of some form shapes. A combination of these forms gives your landscape interest and tapestry. Tapestry is the art of weaving plants together in a garden to create a pleasing combination. And I'll talk about this throughout the presentation. In 2017, my friend purchased this home. And so these are the, these, this landscaping is the owner's um, landscaping and she was happy with it the round forms of the maples and the round forms of all the conifers. Very clean and it's what she wanted. What Joan wanted was this. So in two years, she has texture, form, line, and color. So here's the line between the sidewalk and the soil, the sidewalk and the stones. She has upward form of the conifers, a regular form of the Hinoki cypress over here. And look at the color. When you drive by now, your eye is immediately drawn to this landscape. We're gonna talk about logistics. You want to check with your homeowner's HOA before making a major change to your landscape. Many have strict guidelines on landscape improvements. I'm landscape chair for our HOA, and I have many rules to follow. Check with your neighbors to see if they have suggestions on how to minimize the impact on them. In this photo, look at the different approaches to landscaping. Although all the houses are very similar, 
the landscaping in front of them makes each one unique. Locate all pipes and underground utilities if you plan to change grades. Dig trenches more than 18 inches deep or dig up patios and sidewalks. And most municipalities or local utilities offer services for finding and making underground lines. I live in a community where the houses are 10 feet apart. So where the man is standing is our driveway. And this driveway is my neighbor's. And when we bought our houses, the developer had put in three cedar trees, which were already 15 feet. And both our neighbors and us felt that we were trapped. So we got permission to take them out. I put in the shrubbery and my neighbor put in the roses. Then we have the gray green box of utilities, which I didn't really wanna see. So the landscape contractor I was working with at the time, his crew brought me the boulder that weighs 200 pounds and you usually pay for stones by the pound. And they gently laid it with a Kubota right in front of the utility box. And we had a discussion before, please don't hit the utility box. And then I put a container with an annual every year. So the design plan, you have to think about this and it's really important before you start digging and buying plants is how, what do you want in your garden? What kind of mood do you want? Formal, exotic, wild, cottage, suburban ranch? How are you going to walk through this space? What will you do there? Do you need room for children to play, your pets? Do you have room for a garden workspace like a garden shed? compost pile, a staging area for those plants you've bought but haven't quite got into the ground yet? Do you want a vegetable garden? How much time do you want to spend in your garden? Weeding, staking, deadheading, raking. Is it a private garden, which is usually your backyard? Or do you want to share it with the public, which is usually your front yard? So remember this these two beautiful blue chairs, because we're going to see them again in a bit. The base map, what does it do? So Jeff Fisher is a graphic design artist and his baseline map is so wonderful, it could be framed. So he has the driveway in, this is the public sidewalk and this is the parking strip. And this is his house. We'll see the house and the garden much later. So creating a base map is one of the first steps in creating a successful garden design. The base map is a drawing that graphically and proportionally displays the existing conditions of the site, including big trees that you don't wanna move. Essentially, it shows what's on the property, where it is and what size. This is the time to decide the hardscape before any planting is done. On the Base map, designate north. This is used to chart the sun and shade patterns. Locate your sidewalks, outbuildings, trees. And this is used to decide the space needed for garden beds or borders. So this is what I see. I use graph paper where one inch equals four feet. And in this drawing, all the potential plants are here how many, and what size they are at maturity. And then you can use a transparent piece of paper over this garden and color it in to see if you've got color throughout the whole garden design. So your basic tools are pencil, graph paper, tracing paper. There are tech tools out there that are very good. iPhone has iScapes. There's computer AutoCAD, so you can look through and app the apps and find one that's comfortable for you. So this is the basic rule, design and implement all the hardscape first. So when Joan moved into her property, where this tree is, is the front of the house where the street is. Then this was just basically 
an area where you put things where you didn't know where they didn't fit into the garage anymore. So Joan took out the arbor body and put in the fence. Here's the arbor with those blue chairs. So now she has privacy from the front and the street. She outlined a gravel stage um, area to put in all her, heart, her troughs. She outlined a perennial bed with the irrigation. The irrigation is the first thing you put in after you laid out your garden. And this is it today. So this, these are the blue chairs. These black plastic pots hold her tomatoes. She has troughs for her garden, vegetable garden, so she can garden in place for a long time. And this is her perennial bed. But the hardscape was done first. Now we're gonna talk about practical issues. Paths, steps, patios and decks, pergolas, arbors, and lighting. When you have a path, it's really nice to announce the path. So this gardener has two variegated boxwoods that are pruned into the shape of cones. Or you could use pots, hopefully of the same size and the same color. And you say, ta-da, this is the way into the path. This is a very casual path, but look, she's announced the path with stonework. And the path is really cool because it leans, leads the eye to this lime green bench. When you're creating a path, you want it wide enough for comfortable passage. So your main paths where two people can walk side by side comfortably, that's at least five feet. A secondary path like this one is a state where someone can walk single file, so, and it's about three feet. The disappearing path is one of my favorite, very favorite things to do in the garden. So you go around the corner, you don't know what's there because you can't see it. And often I have a disappearing path that ends in a fence, but it still adds interest and mystery. What you're doing in your garden is creating a, an illusion which is really a fun thing to do. Or why is the curve in the path? So you're walking along and then all of a sudden your eye sees the orange umbrella, the orange pillow and the orange container. So I asked the homeowner uh, why the curve was in the path. Was it because you couldn't dig out the rock so you could have a linear path? And she said, no, I put the rock there, which meant that's why the, the path curved. This is also an illusion. It's great. This is a natural path. It's five feet long. When you create a path, you have to think about tripping. There are three main areas to think about when creating a path. Mobility, meaning can someone use it with a walker, a cane, or a wheelchair? Tripping, because it's an uneven surface and the liability if someone falls. So this is a very nice path. The grass is kind of coming in and the roadie is thinking, ooh, I've got room. So the five foot path is now three feet. That happens. <laughs> it's important to provide secure paving, especially in rainy and wintry weather. So this brick path, is very wide, very nice to come up to this colonial house. It mimics the uh, colonial house. Then you've got these great uh, roses as an entrance to the path and then to the house. But bricks can get mossy and then in the very frost, you can have ice on the paths and it's very slippery. So you have to think about how else would you get to the front door? This landscape of the garden is very informal and natural, and so is the wood chip path in this nice wide area, at least five feet. A slate path is one of the hardest to do well because there's so many times that you could trip. So when you put it in, get as close together as you can 
have very smooth tops, and then you put in crushed gravel of some sort to anchor the slate path. Also, when you create a path, think of people's strides. How long are their steps? I'm five feet tall. So my stride is gonna be very different than a person who's six feet tall. So if you're laying out your steps, think of everyone that could possibly use your slate path. So when you create steps, they should be gentle. Otherwise they're too steep. And when you're coming down a steep path, steep steps, it's very scary. It's a, when you create your steps, it's also time to add lighting or a handrail if you want. This formula is how to figure out how to make your steps. And it's in that four page handout that, that you will find the link to at the end of the presentation. <clears throat> so the run, which is the depth or the horizontal area, plus twice the rise, with, and the rise is the height, the vertical portion. So the run, which is the depth, plus twice the rise or the height should equal 26. 26 is the magic number. So here, if you have a six inch rise, which is really one of the most comfortable rises, times two is 12. That means your depth must be 14. And we're thinking of the six foot person again, that's his shoe, her shoe will be very comfortable on that step. So in this path, there's a change in grade. When you're in uh, walking along the path in a garden, you're looking at the garden. You're not necessarily looking at where your feet are going, but your eye catches color. So by outlining the change in grade with red brick, you will see the change in grade and not trip. You can also do a change in grade with containers because your, cont your eye will catch the color of either the container and the plants within it and realize that there's a change in grade. Stone steps are usually cheaper than a total paved job. And you can create all these little pockets where you can put in plants to soften the look of the stone. You just have to double check each time that um, the plants aren't taking over the steps. And the gritty surface makes them less slippery when it rains. Now we're gonna talk about patios and decks. You need to have room to accommodate dining and mingling. You allow four square feet per person. Because when you think of people sitting either at your dining table out here or in a chair, people slouch. They don't sit up straight like Emily Post would like. So you have to allow room for slouching. And then between the dining and the chairs, you leave a three foot wide perimeter of open space. You have to remember the six foot person that's winding their way through all the, the chairs and the table. Look at the barbecue. Does it need a gas line? Is it far enough away to be safe for pe people milling about? Is it too close to the house? Uh, we were at a dinner this summer and the uh, host was grilling chicken and all of a sudden they caught on fire and scorched the house. The chicken turned out fine. The barbecue was toast and they got to do a paint job on their house. So now when I see a barbecue, I'm always conscious of what is it going to take. And I, when I was designing a pad, a garden for a client, I was doing the side, the front, and the back. And in the backyard, the patio, and we had the um, one of the parties, and I had the furniture all laid out. And the path was in, the irrigation line was in, and the crew and I were working on the granite bubbler. And one of the parties, party B, came up and said, where's the barbecue? And party A said, not on the patio, 
party B said, mm -hmm, that's what I want. So the crew and I kept working away. And in a few days, party B said that they had come to an agreement. And what they would like is that the barbecue would be over on the side of the house and then would roll up to the patio when they wanted to barbecue. And that was great. And I would just need to fix the path, the path and the irrigation line. And the whole goal is to have an area where both parties are happy and they really enjoy their garden. But it meant the crew and I got to redo about 15 feet of path and adjust the irrigation line, which was in ground by that time. So now when I see a barbecue, I always have to think through where it's gonna do, where it's gonna go. So in this house, she put in the awning, great room for dining. This is the house with the wonderful blue chairs, various seating areas, now lots of containers. So she's created an oasis for herself with this patio. And there's still room for Jory the dog to scamper about. So this is Jeff's house when they bought it. Very crowded dining, room for a couple containers, grass, not much room for just sitting around. Then plan B, they have two dining areas, they have a shed, they've got wonderful brick paving. The landscape is turning into something really rich and full. And this is it today when I tour the garden in August. His whole, their whole garden has all these colors throughout the garden, orange, lime, red. It's wonderful. Plenty of room to entertain and enjoy yourself. So now we're gonna talk about lighting. Perhaps you wanna set a festive tone for your patio for evening. Maybe you have a shadowy corner you need to illuminate for security reasons or the path leading from the driveway to the door, and it's a hazard because it's too dark, or you want it for curb appeal, or you're highlighting your home's architecture, or water feature, or ornamental lighting. In this house, they put in this great awning, and they have rope lighting down so that they can sit in, the, in their garden at night and see their garden. She grows roses and wonderful gardener. See the entrance to the path? Dwarf Alberta spruce, yay. Three foot paved, very little tripping possibilities, yay. Destination, a bench, yay. And the arbor is wonderful. Okay, so you build them at least seven feet tall for safe clearance. But if you put in clematis and wisteria and they hang down and you have to think of the six foot person, they're going to, it's going to touch them. So you have to raise the arbor by about 18 inches. People don't like to be touched by plants. It gives them the willies. This is the entrance to that garden that had the lime green bench at the end. But look how wide the gate is to get in so that they can have enough room for the wagons, the wheelbarrows, the tools to get in. It's lovely. This is a wonderful arbor. Look at that, and I think it has grape on the top. Nice five foot sidewalk getting up. But see the step? She put containers there. So your eye catches the color of the flowers, no, and you know that there's a step involved. She's a wonderful gardener, has excellent plantings. And as what happens, the plantings kind of take over the, the pavement. And so now the five foot path is three feet. But it's it works. So now we're going to talk about plant combinations. This is Jeff's house when he bought it. It's a cottage style house. This is in North Portland. And the houses on either side are very similar. So the grass is straight and then it falls down to the, the public sidewalk. So in plan B, they put in a retaining wall, so it's now flat. 
took out the grass. They had these great big stone steps on either side of the retaining wall so you could get into their front yard. And this is how it is when I saw it in August. So the same colors as in the back patio, but now the front yard is usable and they have enough plantings here so that people can't see into them from the sidewalk, which is down below the retaining wall. So this garden has evolved over time with exciting plantings that reflects the owner's love of color and tapestry. So tapestry, again, is the art of weaving plants in a garden to create a pleasing combination. A good size for a border, if in a perfect world, would be eight feet by 24 feet. But you have to adapt it to your location, time, and budget. When in doubt, start small so you get the hang of it. Plant perennials in large groups, unless it's a larger architectural specimen, as an ornamental grass or the vine maple. Use odd number groups of three and five and so on, because they give a planting mass. Think in triangles or staggering of plants as opposed to planting in rows, so the plants don't look like they're in a military formation. This keeps the patterning subtle, the plantings intertwine, and the landscapes overlook informal. Mix evergreen and deciduous shrubs, as well as small trees to improve the scale and the mass. So let's take apart this uh, photo and diagram it like you would a sentence. Here we have lace leaf maple, uh, vine maple with burgundy green, heuchera, and this pot. Those are all shades of burgundy. So follow the white arrow. This is part of a triangle. One, two, three. Now this planting hangs together. These are lime green barberries, which contrast with the burgundy. Cool. This deciduous plant. These are the ground story with the impatience and the heuchera, which add, adds to the mass. Now we're going to talk about texture, form, and color. These are the foundations of garden design. In this photo, Look at the blue, and we're just gonna talk about color first. Look at the gray green of the hellebore, the blue green, and the blue green of this plant, the burgundy of the heuchera, and the astilbe, the grassy of the aconicoa, and this grassy area here. All the plants have the same color intensity so that they flow together and don't overpower one another, except for this red little guy who snuck in. Texture has two key aspects, shape and surface. So shape is the visual outlines that you can see even from a distance. Bold, ferny, linear, palmate, curly, grassy, lacy, jagged. So let's look at this. You have the heart-shaped leaf of the brunera, the palmate leaf of the fatsia, the conifer needles, the ferny leaves of the fern, and the oblong leaves of the perscaria. Now let's look at the surface. The surface has ribs, buckers, mat. A, a rhododendron has mat leaves. Mat means it absorbs light where you can have a shiny leaf like in a camellia and a shiny leaf reflects light. You can have thorny leaves or fuzziness like a lamb's ear. So you could just, this would be a smoother leaf. This is more of a ribbed look. All of this creates tapestry. The next thing is layers of plantings. The upper story links the sky to the landscape. And you usually do this with trees. And a general rule is to select trees and shrubs that will mature at eight feet to 15 feet for two-story homes. The mid-story is where most of your plants are gonna go. And the hydrangea is one example. 
This is where the majority of the plants in your garden are going to be. The ground story there are the low growing plants. The, I call them the accessories or the jewels in your borders, paths, and entryways. This is that level right here. In this photo, look at this lemon cypress. It's just pointing your eye to the sky. But there's another element here and it's called borrowed landscape. See the conifers? If you can see it and you like it, it could be your part of your landscape. These trees are actually not on the property, but they frame this area so well, you can take it. Let's go back. If this area was a manufacturing building, it was an eyesore, well, then you just pretend it's not there. You would let, look at all these plants instead. So repetition, let your eye move around. That's how you guide your eye over your whole garden. This is a five acre plot. So you have barberry, grass, grass, barberry, grass, grass, then a bunch of roundy moundies. And then in the grass, she planted this partridge family. So enclosure and intimacy gives you a sense of privacy and calmness. So in Jeff's yard, plan A, this is where the stones are being installed. The retaining wall is done. Plan B is the slate path has been laid. She, they have seating that looks toward the front door. Look at the plantings. Now there they have a shield from the uh, sidewalk down below them, the street, and they have a large public park that um, on the other side of the street. So this is when I saw it in August. All the colors that they love, orange, yellow, lime green, red. So go, give your plants room to grow. Plant them so that when they have reached maturity, the plants are not crowded. And you can find what the size that is at maturity because that will be on the plant tag. When you then plant quick growing plants or short lived filler plants to temporarily fill in the beds. So behind Joan's house is a, a golf course and they water every day. So this area became an area that had puddling. So she created a rain garden. What I want to talk about are these two plants. These are Hakona Kloa, uh, uh, herbaceous grass, and they will be about three feet by three feet at maturity. So as you're looking at this area, think of what that burst of yellow will go to be. But that she planted them so there's plenty of room for them to grow. So now you can see how much the Hakona Claw have grown. This is a saxifrage, and that will get to go elsewhere once the, the Hakona Claws reach their maturity. But that burst of yellow just highlights this part of the garden. Perennials mature in one to three years. The first year they sleep, the second year they creep, and the third year they leap. Shrubs mature in three to five years. Root establishment can take one year for perennials and shrubs and two years or more for trees. So this is, means a good watering plan is essential to the success of your garden. Place any plants that are more than 30 inches to 36 inches tall, at least two to three feet back from the paths and patios. Otherwise, the place will feel crowded and like you're going through a tunnel on a path. And then keep thorny plants like roses away from traffic areas. So this is a very small path and it's made smaller by the exuberance of the Hakona Claw. Many plants offer foliage, fruit, and bark for a year long color, form, and texture. This extends the seasonal appeal with foliage and you don't have to deadhead them. 
think of flowers as an accent in your garden. So in this garden, it's about uh, late spring, early summer. The astilbe is blooming, and it looks like a white lily is just coming out. But look at all the interest in the garden from the leaves. You have the speckled leaves of the hosta, lime green of hosta. It, this is the variegated dogwood, mainly white and green. Got this really deep green of this plant. Okay, and a grassy effect. And then low growing um, ground cover. So the orange bulbs. This home was on tour and the homeowner went to, I think, Dollar Store, bought all these orange balls and then put them on stakes. And she put them throughout every single path. So as you follow the orange balls through the garden, this is how you know you're going in the right direction. So grass has its place. It's a place for the eye to rest and it's a place for, to play. And it's a color too. Grass green is the color of peace and renewal. Here are the family of partridges. Here's the barberry, the grass, barberry grass. Mount Roundy forms repeated, the grass repeated. So look at the orbs. She could have planted them in a straight line, but that would have been like a barrier to your eye. But planting them in a triangle leads your eye forward and up to the borrowed landscaping. This is the border of that five piece, five acre property. And this is in another area, but you can see it and it just makes this part so beautiful. How to create combinations. You wanna use key plants as a basis for creating combinations with other plants. Review your plant list and choose plants that bloom in different seasons. These will be the anchors of your design. Build combinations by surrounding them with complementary plants that bloom at the same time. This will strengthen the visual appeal of your garden. In a small garden, too many colors can look chaotic rather than harmonious. It can look like a garden of jelly beans. So pick a warm color or cool color scheme and choose plants from your plant list. You wanna contrast billowing and airy plants with bold textured plants. And then you place rounded forms next to spiky forms and use low mounding or trailing plants at the front of the border to unify the edge. So this is my garden. And remember I told you our houses are 10 feet apart. So on my, this is the bark dust alley between our houses. So on my side, I have a four foot cement sidewalk. That left six feet to be available for planting. So I asked my neighbor for permission to plant. So this bed is six feet by 60 feet. So my structural pants is this clematis, but it's on a tour, so it has mass. The mid-story plant is this oak leaf hydrangea with white, which is a transition color. Then I have a variegated dogwood, a columnar dogwood, but I've had it pruned into a cone. Behind it is a camellia with contorted limbs. This is Tradescantia, which has a grassy effect or a spiky effect, but it blooms in purple, which picks up the purple of the clematis. And then underneath, I planted soft terracotta color heuchera and hellebores that bloom in early winter. And then the hellebores, even with their leaf color, will send up flower spikes. You want to focus on the key structural plants that will provide interest throughout the year. So whether they're form, foliage, flowers, or branching pat patterns, they strike the eye and your eyes led immediately toward them. So this is one of my favorite gardens in Southeast uh, Portland. This is a conifer with really deeply uh, lobed needles, very massive. 
And next to it, they planted this lace leaf uh, maple. And it's beautiful. And then the surrounding plants underneath fill in the get fill in the garden. Over here is a miscanthus morning light. And in this part of the garden, this is the structural plant. And it brings light to the garden. So I want to talk about a triangle again. This is a burgundy um, barberry. It's one of my favorites. It's called Admiration. And it has burgundy leaves outlined in lime green, each one. This is a red pot with yellow aconicloa. This is a bronze ball. So my triangle here is the brown ball, the red pot, excuse me, ah, bless, and the barberry. So you, your eye sees color, whether it's the brown ball or the red pot, and it becomes part of the garden. So color can come from in, an inanimate object as well as from plants. So a color scheme is a way of combining color for different effects. Colors change depending on their surroundings, such as neighboring color, light, and texture. And one of the handouts at the end of this presentation goes into color theory. So color's brightness will be enhanced when it's placed to an, a contrasting color, one that falls on the opposite edge of the colored wheel. So look at purple and yellow. That enhances both colors. My favorite combination is purple and lime green. And I use that throughout my garden, as you can tell. A color's brightness will decrease in intensity when placed next to an analogous color, one that lies next to it on the color wheel. So look at lime green. Yellow on one side, a deeper green on the other side. So the lime green is softer when it's used in this combination rather than when it's combined with purple. So it's a way of expressing your per personality in your garden. You can have a warm palette, which is bold and playful, or restrained, which is a cool palette, and it's a serene palette. Warm colors, red, yellow, orange, demand attention and evoke excitement, just like this front yard of Jeff's garden. Pale colors, yellows, whites, reflect light and illuminate shady spots. Cool colors like blues, purples, greens, pastel colors recede into the background. And neutral colors like white, gray, silver, black even, can be used as transition areas between two different color schemes. So let's look at the plants along the driveway. Just look at the yellow flowers. We don't have to know their names right now. We're just looking at color. So you have yellow, yellow, hot fuchsia, red. So this purple here gives your eye a place to adjust gives your eye room to adjust between yellow and red or yellow and a hot fuchsia. I use transition colors a lot, especially purple, to go from one color to another. Look at this. This is a wonderful garden called Florimagoria in Southeast Portland. So these are alliums that the owners have painted orange and purple. But they've left natural color alliums, which are blue-gray, to soften the effect of all this orange and purple. So you have intense drama with neutrals. Your eye can rest. Then they planted this phlox underneath, which has this in, this in the same color scheme of the purple. And that adds mass to this whole garden planting. Feel the energy that these strong reds create in this plant combination. You have the red of the poppies, the red of the glass, the red of the roses, 
energy and excitement. Now, we go around the corner, and this is in the same garden, and the feeling is entirely different. See how the energy of this soft, pale palette is different than those strong reds. There is a visible calmness when people are in these spaces. So this plant is Flomus russelliana, commonly known as the Arde Jerusalem sage. It's a mass planting of them. And look what the owner did. She planted, planted, put a pillow with the same pale yellow, which picks up the pale yellow of the flomus. It's wonderful. Now look at the wall, this, ter this soft terracotta wall. It enhances everything that's within it. This is a wonderful combination. So plant selection. Make a list of all the plants you want to grow. Then list all the attributes of the plant. Our region in the Willamette Valley is zone eight. So that's something to look for when you're looking at the plant tag. Don't buy plants that have needs that cannot be met. Don't put a shade plant in full sun because it will burn. And don't put a sun plant in shade because it will always lean and not be as happy as it could be. In tight spaces, in a small garden, every selection counts. So if you have a blooming plant, it should bloom at least two weeks. Don't buy any plant unless adequate growing space has been chosen in advance. This is hard, because even if you have a plant list and you're in a nursery, all of a sudden you see a plant that's so cool, you must have it. And then you come home and you walk around your garden and say, well, I wonder where you're gonna go. But you always find a space. So number to buy, how many plants of a specific one you buy, the plant name in Latin, so there's no misunderstanding of what you want, the common name, whether it takes sun or shade, the type it is, evergreen, deciduous, herbaceous, the size at maturity, foliage color, bloom color, if it's fragrant. Many people are allergic to the fragrance or just don't like it, and when it blooms. When it blooms is how you choose the seasonal appeal, plus the foliage color. This is a spreadsheet that I created for one section of a garden. When I'm doing a large garden that has many sections, I create a plant list and uh, Excel spreadsheet for each section. And then I create a master, which has all the plants from all the six areas, for example, so that when you go into a garden and you need 10 liriope, but only five are going in this section and four in other sections or five in other sections, at least you're buying, you only have to go to the nursery once, hope, hopefully. So look at this. The owner had one, yay. Five liriope for a total of 24 plants. Plant name, the common name, the sunshade, the type, and the size. And this is the rest of it. If it's foliage color, bloom color, if it's fragrant, and when it blooms. And this is a column I pay particular attention to. I try for at least seasons of color or interest. I found this article by Karen Hug in the Washington Post, and it is so true. Not figuring out what kind of soil and pH you have, creating a border that is too small or too large, and usually it's too small. Because you would like at least six feet so that you can get in three layers of planting. That's how you get tapestry. Planting in the wrong space, buying too few or too many plants for a space, buying for flowers and not thinking of foliage, not using trees and shrubs, planting beneath large trees because those large tree roots will take the water first, not matching the needs of water of the plants close to each other. 
So this is the schedule that you do. Do all the hardscape first. It's too hard to come back and redo something when you realize, dang, I wish I had put a path in, or I wish I put lighting in, and you can use that through underground wiring. Amend the soil for, before planting if needed. Use bold accents to punch up borders. Plant single specimens first. By doing that, then you can figure out where the next layer of planting goes. Then place the permanent plants, then plant the perennial and annual plants. Remember that it takes the first two to three years of the garden for plants to become established. A watering plant is crucial. When I'm finished with a client's garden room or walking through and they're so happy and it looks so good, we have the water talk, how important it is to water what the plants need. Now, I often suggest a moisture meter so that you can go around and put in the moisture reader throughout the garden to make sure you're watering too much or too late, too little. A garden grows, changes, and dies. There's always fine tune that happens. Don't be afraid to move plants around as they grow. Hopefully, you will have created a place where you can enjoy your garden and admire your creativity. This is one of my favorite hydrangeas, and it's in that 60-foot border that I showed you earlier, called Lemon High Wave. So this has yellow, green, and often cream-colored leaves, and a very soft blue lace cap flower, and it gets about five feet by five feet. Thank you very much. So in this presentation, this is the color and the color wheel. This is the, where you can find all the color theory. This is the four page handout that covers everything that I talked about in this presentation. This is the Garden Design 101, the 10 minute U University handout, and it gives the general subjects. And if we didn't get your question answered, you can go to 10 minute U. Thank you. Okay, Laura, what a lovely step-by-step -step, uh, presentation you put together. Um, we had so many wonderful comments all along the way and a few questions as well. So um, when you got to Pathways, you struck a chord with folks who ha are trying to design Pathways. So question one is, what do you recommend for a base for Pathways so that if whatever though you put in stones or gravel or bark, it doesn't sink and rise and it, that kind of thing. I've had the best luck with three quarter minus or um, quarter minus, and then you tamp them down really hard. So and that provides the basis so you can lay rock or stone on top of it. How deep, Laura? How, what does the oh, Two or three inches. Okay. Do you have a, a recommendation for a, a, a steppable that you would put between stones that you think is a real golden winner or is it kind of based on shade and sun requirements? Yeah, sun and shade are the first thing you look for. Steppables are great. When you plant beneath stones, you have to realize that the steppable or whatever ground cover you're going to use is not going to stay in that cute little four inch pot size. It's gonna to grow to five to six inches. So you need to take that into account or you're always trimming the stones to keep the plant from growing onto the stone, which, which it wants to do. A wonderful tip, a wonderful tip. The other concern people had was they probably have stepping stones with, with crushed gravel uh, between them. How do you prevent weeds and grass from coming up perpetually in that pathway? Um, so there, one is mechanical and I use a stirrup hole and a broom and, or, or a trowel. It, it's, kind, it's time consuming. If it's a large, I have a lot of long paths in my garden mm -hmm. and especially with bittersweet, which I get very mad at, I pour vinegar on them, just straight oh, vinegar. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. That is an excellent, an excellent solution. Vinegar, yeah. not yeah. toxic, gets those guys. Yeah. 
Yeah, those pop seeds could drive you wild. Um, all and, right. and it's best if you do it in the sun because uh, vinegar is so acidic. So what you're doing by pouring it on in the sun, you're burning the you have to, you're burning the roots, which is the whole goal. You got to get them, get them good. <laughs> yeah. um, one quickie question: Do you happen to know what species of Trandenscanthia was in that one photo that you have the, the name? Uh huh. Um, I can't remember. Okay. okay. But but when you go buy it, buy the one with lime green, lime oh. green leaves. The lime green one. Okay. Good. They'll love, appreciate knowing that. <laughs> yeah, I guess about two to three feet. Um, uh -huh. it, it gets a little bit larger, but it doesn't travel, which is really important. Uh, I, I'm I, I mean, um, there was two questions that have to do with lists of plants. Do you, this individual is interested in some native plants, but she just doesn't want a native plant list. Do you have a list of shrubs and plants that you would recommend? where they might go to look? I would go to the Native Plant Society. They have excellent lists. Also, I think there's 10 minute EU handouts. There that are have uh, plants. Okay. For our area. Okay, yeah, that's what she's looking for is she doesn't, all, she does want native plants but not 100% native plants. Right. Um, and a, one couple wants to know, as we are all heading out into our yards on these sunny days, and we're noting what plants did not like the ice that we had in the cold weather, are you noticing any particular, in their case, their um, Gravelia and their Escalonia both seem to have suffered mightily over the cold. Um, are you noticing any other climate change, plants that are being severely ex, uh, affected by climate? My Daphne Adora lost all its leaves. Yeah. I now have three. I know but it doesn't bloom, look so they didn't oh. affect the blooms. And there are some <laughs> plants that just look like they're scorched. So when I go around my garden or my neighbor's garden, who was really concerned, if I can bend the branches, those little twigs, then I know the plant is still alive and the leaves will probably come back out. Uh, and I and I have a couple that surprisingly this year never been affected by cold before have been affected, but I see little green buds starting. So yeah. I guess maybe we're telling them don't lose heart. There may be, there may be yeah. uh, some hope yeah. there. We just um, need some warm weather. I, per, per, um, okay, the one other person was, as considering building a walkway arch, do you have uh, size tips for him on what he should consider in width and height for his arch? So remember the path, the path should, for people to walk comfortably is five feet. So if I had the money and the space, I would go seven feet for the basis of your pergola or, or arbor. And then we, you always have to think about the six foot person. And so I would make it at least seven, I would make it eight and a half feet tall. Perfect. And then you get to plant on it. And I, if you can make it long, then you really get an effect. True. That is yeah. make it yeah. nice. Yeah. Um, I loved your garden, uh, your vinegar idea, because we did have one other question, some that has a graveled area, probably for parking, and it's mm -hmm. getting thin, and she wanted to know what can she possibly put on there to discourage grass and weeds. And I, again, I'm guessing you're going to suggest vinegar is a really excellent solution for that. Yeah, and it might be time to get a new layer of gravel put on. I find that in my past, too. The, um, you have to realize that we, we live in an environment where there's always going to be grass seeds and there's always going to be weed seeds that float in. And so you will always have this problem and don't be discouraged. It's just part of gardening, part of nature. And I, I know a lot of people have paver paths, you know, where the stones are fit tightly together in the hopes that nut dirt won't get between those two. And we know it always does. And then those little weeds come up um, <laughs> again. Are you using vinegar? Are you can, are you considering using like the flame? You know, lots of people use flame to. <laughs> well, <you're> actually, <laughs> that is <laughs> like the next level. <laughs> and I'm not there. Yeah. I don't have the flamethrower. <laughs> Right, and I know. I've seen it work, and I know in this one property that is a farm, they do use it because there's just not enough vinegar in the world Correct. to run a large piece of property. And an aside, 
two people on my street have set their bark dust on fire and had to call the fire department. And so, you know, even though they were being careful and they knew that that was a, an issue, a little bit of heat, a heat on the bark dust and a little fan of a wind, uh, it can get out of control. So consider um, uh, yeah. someone else has just chimed in that boiling water also works. So yeah, yeah. The, the only problem with boiling water is you cannot boil enough to go out and pour it on and then you go back in and boil. So I find that vinegar uh, is easiest for me, but boiling water absolutely works. And the whole key is you're boiling the roots and killing them. Exactly. Get those at the roots. You don't want to repeat this every week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Well, that ties up our questions. You did a wonderful job answering them. And, Thank you. Uh, and we all enjoyed it so much. We, we're all eager to get outside now and redesign our gardens. <laughs> and Cheryl. I want to thank you for pictures of your garden in the, in the presentation. <laughs> they, well, you made me think of some things that I thought, okay, I see some things I need to do. So I guess I better get out there and do it. <laughs> well, <that's beautiful. laughs> Thanks, Laura. You're welcome. Bye, everyone.